will now turn to uh, Phil and Napoli. But uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Tim for uh, being here in business school and courageously advocating that horizontal is kind of good and vertical is bad, whereas most economists actually right. the opposite. I know. I know. opposite. So you'll have to have some debates here uh, with, with some of my colleagues. Now, uh, Phil Napoli, uh, We've flown him in from Fordham at, uh, and, uh, <laughs> at the, just as we did with Tim, who came across Amsterdam Avenue, uh, uh, Phil from, uh, from uh, uh, Lincoln Center uh, campus, and he's the Professor of Communications and Media Management at the Graduate School of Business and Director of the Donald McGannon Communications Research Center at Fordham University. He's been a thought leader in the communications uh, uh, discipline with numerous books, including about and has played an important role in the media, uh, uh, in the media concentration debate through his writing and speaking. I, I, I sort of, from the, the title of the presentation uh, of the uh, of the panel, that has got me really thinking about this this question of what should the uh, or what can the role of of the academic community be uh, within the context of this broader you know realm of. Um, media ownership policy making, media ownership research, uh, and you know, and I come to it from sort of, so, you know, as sort of a participant observer for, uh, in a variety of, of contexts. I've been a submitter of studies into FCC proceedings and watched them get, you know, either waved around, you know, enthusiastically or torn apart, uh, depending on who is, you know, uh, you know, on the perspective of the, you know, and the, and the nature of the results. Uh, I've been a, uh, involved with my research center commissioning studies submitted into FCC proceedings that were conducted by other people, uh, provided expert testimony to, the con to Congress and the FCC on some of these issues, and even served as a, as a peer reviewer, which is part of the process in the, our, our media ownership proceeding now in this country, uh, for studies commissioned uh, by the FCC. So I, I feel like I, I, you know, I've been involved in this in a, in a variety of, uh, uh, of ways. Uh, and for those of you who um, are, are here from, from other countries, I, I should emphasize that my, my observations really are focused for the moment on the, uh, on the U.S. context where we have sort of this mo interesting model where every four years our Federal Communications Commission is required to uh, reassess uh, the media uh, ownership regulations and make any, any changes that are deemed uh, relevant. Now, uh, within this context then of, of rethinking the role of the academy, the, the, the thing that often strikes me uh, about um, the media ownership proceedings as, they, as they, they've, they've sort of happened in, in this country is the extent to which each one starts as if the last one never happened. It's this incredibly ad hoc uh, proceeding. Uh, where there's this mad scramble in the months before the proceeding is officially st slated to begin to identify possible topics of study and possible researchers and what questions should we ask. And, and if you really do take a step back and, and realize that well, if this is something that is supposed to happen every four years, why isn't there any systematic information infrastructure to guide uh, our assessment of these policies. And that has, for a variety of reasons that I've gone into in some of my other research, never really uh, developed here. And in fact, in some ways, it has uh, diminished, as we've seen a lot of our uh, federal data gathering, for example, activities um, sort of um, you know, offloaded to uh, commercial data providers, which has a variety of, I think, potentially damaging effects ranging from accessibility issues to just the fact that now you've got data being produced for uh, markets other than really the policy making sector. And so the, 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 the congruence between the data and the questions that need to be asked and answered um, you know, uh, suffers. Uh, so anyway, uh, which gets to my larger point that I want to start out with. Um, which is that research uh, in many ways is easy, uh, but the data are hard. Or as I was sitting here, I thought really what this should say is research is cheap, uh, but data are expensive. Uh, that is, when asked, when the situation arises, um, we're all in a position as researchers that, you know, yes, I can give you a study that addresses this particular topic or this particular issue. Uh, but as someone who's been involved in, in these ownership proceedings over the past two or three go-arounds, the thing that always strikes me is the consistency with which so many of the studies that become the primary grist of the policy debate um, 
are, are, have these just incredibly vulnerable Achilles heels of one type or another. And often uh, these vulnerabilities revolve around the lack of avail. Someone would call me right in the middle of my talk, right? At, uh, I'm buzzing away here, just ignore that. Um, but anyway, um, I can't build that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's got to help. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so um, we don't have that, we, whether, whether it's issues of, of lack of access to data or the fact that oftentimes the data don't go back in any kind of reasonable period of time. Uh, media ownership policy making in this country uh, has really um, bumped up against some brick walls in terms of, uh, of, the, of the research infrastructure. Uh, that uh, that should be there to facilitate, uh, especially because it's something that is supposed to happen every four years. Okay. Um, so that gets me that me thinking about well, are there some alternative ways that the academic community could start thinking about their role in this process, less as the provider of the individual study or the one-off book, uh, or but more as contributors <laughs> to a systematic and stable and longitudinal. Uh, information infrastructure that could guide not just media ownership research, um, you know, narrowly defined, because one of the things I also want to talk about today is that I think uh, given the nature of the media environment uh, we have today in which um, the economic models for production and distribution are changing so dramatically and in which the dynamics of media consumption are changing so dramatically, media ownership research needs to be uh, integrated into a larger, uh, what we're calling here, information uh, you know, ecology, so to speak, uh, research. Uh, so first and foremost, I, you know, again, it's a hard thing when you think about uh, you know, the nature of the resources that are often available to us as academic researchers. A lot of us here direct research centers that address these issues one form or another. Uh, but to think about ourselves maybe as just as uh, with a, a commitment to developing a, an accessible and rigorous set of resources that for, whether it's policymakers, policy advocates, scholars, <laughs> could access and know that um, this is something that will be there today, and it will be there tomorrow, and it will be there 10 years from now. Uh, it's interesting, right? There are so many different countries here represented uh, all doing this kind of media ownership research. And I wonder how many of you would find yourself in the position of knowing that, you know what? When this study's done, um, it's, it's done, and it'll probably, it might get orphaned to some degree. And who's to say that five years from now, uh, someone else has taken up the mantle to continue this kind of research? Because a big part of, of doing uh, and understanding how to make media ownership policy is to understand, of course, the trends that we see. Uh, so, so, so point one I want to make is, is that we start thinking potentially, uh, and this goes to the, 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 um, you know, the, the sort of pitches we make to funders very much as well. And I recognize that this is not the kind of thing that funders often find uh, that exciting because they're very, very, and increasingly so, results driven. But this idea that, look, we want to create a, uh, a some sort of permanent resource to guide research and policy making in this area. Um, so as, as I mentioned, I, I, you know, this is sort of uh, you know, my thinking about a direction I'd like to see uh, we pursue in the future. Another one, uh, to do this, of course, uh, would need to and should involve working collaboratively as much as possible with governmental uh, and nonprofit institutions. There's a wide range of stakeholders that have an interest in this. Uh, our policymakers are often you know, very much uh, limited in terms of their resources, of course, uh, to gather and, and, and maintain the relevant data in, in, in these areas. Um, you know, that, you know, that, that, that point was already made. Uh, and then third, uh, which I think, and it was funny, Ellie's presentation today sort of um, moved us already in this direction. And I think it sort of helps in some ways to illustrate my point that the, that, that kind of research where we sort of integrate media owner is ownership issues into a broader understanding of the information ecology in which citizens operate. Uh, not just the who owns what, but as, as, as Ellie's talk started to get us in that direction, but also the so what. Uh, increasingly, policymakers, the courts, et cetera, uh, don't just want to know who owns what. And again, in, in the immediate environment that we are you know, looking at today, that simple basic snapshot of who owns what really is just the tip of the iceberg, I think, uh, and the kinds of information uh, we need uh, and, and want to know. Um, Happiness, you know, okay, that's interesting, but, but, but bigger issues about political participation and political knowledge and things like that, uh, and, and corruption. I, that was interesting. I mean, I just think that's a very interesting path you guys are starting to go. Uh, and I, to me, I think that's really 
uh, the future of, 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 you know, of, of media ownership research, not just, you know, hey, look who owns this. Um, so as an example of this, I'm just going to plug a little bit of, of, of some work I've been doing uh, involved in with, the, with an organization here in the U.S., the New America Foundation, um, that is working uh, on, on, on a broader media policy, policy initiative, uh, part of which involves what they're calling a local information ecology mapping project. Now, this is an incredibly uh, labor-intensive and time-consuming and, 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 and you know, undertaking. Um, but again, from my standpoint, this kind of thing only has real value if it, if it persists, if it goes on uh, and is sustainable. Uh, some of you in this room may be familiar with the, uh, the Center for Public Integrity and their media tracker uh, database, which was for a few years very useful to a lot of people. And that, and that thing just essentially became homeless and I think is still drifting around waiting for some institution to provide it with uh, support to keep it going. Uh, and, that, and that more often is, I think, the, the rule rather than the exception for, for, for various sources of types of media ownership research. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this local information ecology mapping project is an outgrowth of the recent uh, Knight Commission report some of you may have uh, seen uh, on informing communities uh, sustaining democracy in the, in the digital age. Uh, and one of the initiatives, the, one of the key recommendations of this was to develop systematic quality measures of community information ecologies and study how they affect social outcomes. So there we get to that issue of not only the, the, you know, who owns what within its broader context of how information flows through a community, because now it's not just who owns what, it's also who produces what. You might be an owner of an outlet, but if you are not uh, an actual producer of content uh, and you are just a passive conduit for content produced elsewhere, then outlets becomes a not too useful measure for us at all in terms of really understanding the health of our, of our media system. So, you know, the, the way things are evolving now makes this kind of research um, you know, more and more challenging because I think it needs to get more and more granular, uh, but also, like I said, to link it to um, these issues of, uh, of social outcomes. So I'm going to do a quick click just to give you a brief look at the, at the kinds of things that uh, we're working on here. I think I need to sign in uh, somewhere. Okay. Um, Case studies that are beginning to be developed. It's, 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 it's sort of a random batch of, of markets at this point. Um, but let's go, for example, to Philadelphia. Log in. And uh, again, for this to be really useful from a policymaking context, it needs to be inclusive. It can't be you know, a few markets. It needs to eventually be every market. It needs to be every year. And it needs to be regularly maintained and, and archived so that you can do longitudinal analysis. <laughs> uh oh. I guess they don't want me working on this anymore. No problem. So, just for example, is from the table of contents, we've got things like the demographics of the market, uh, socioeconomic status data, data on local governments uh, in terms of. Uh, availability of government information sources uh, online. Uh, I mean, some of these are phrases sort of basic yes or no questions, but there's room here to get a lot more uh, rigorous in terms of, of, of gathering this type of information. Uh, local government, you know, transparency of local government, uh, availability of local newspapers, radio, television, uh, digital media. Even you know, we're getting as deep as trying to, you know, to, to, to catalog uh, blogs at the local level. Okay. Um, Google feeds uh, is, is, is a new one. Uh, so to you know, so again, trying to you know to, to capture, which is of course very challenging, uh, the fact that to do this kind of research well, now of course you need to go beyond uh, counting radio, and television stations, and newspapers and things like that. Uh, prevalence and prominence of, of civic organizations, uh, local election turnout, avail you know activity, you know grassroots political activity, uh, political contributions. Um, so again, so to, so putting media ownership research into what I think is the appropriately uh, broader uh, um, ecosystem context, so to speak, that it needs to be in. Uh, so, you know, from my standpoint, what I would like to see um, from the academic community um, is that we 
uh, start thinking about ourselves a little less as providers of individual studies, but more as trying to provide this kind of systematic data and mapping of our media system that needs to be in place at any given time to, to really do a good job of, of assessing uh, media ownership policies. Um, sort of illustrated this already. And uh, when we do, when we combine all of these uh, points of intersection, then we really get to that so what question that I think is, is particularly important. Uh, you can find more information about this particular initiative here. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Phil, for uh, a really interesting presentation. In particular, I want kind of that research that you've kind of introduced here. We can think about how to internationalize that. Absolutely. Kind of, uh, so so this, this is a real good, uh, interesting stuff. And you may just want to make sure that everybody knows where to find it. Uh, what was it? Wiki. Oh, here no, that was that was the internal. So this is this is the site right here. Uh, we can learn more about the initiative. Uh, and, uh, New, New America. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, uh, uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce again uh, Marius Dragomir, uh, who's uh, kind of the research department of the uh, media group uh, of the uh, Open Society Institute. Uh, Marius has worked as a uh, a journalist uh, and um, media observer and academic uh, in, in uh, doing a uh, thesis on post uh, media reform in post communist Europe uh, in Romania, in Czechoslovakia, uh, I, I guess Czech Republic now, and in, uh, in uh, uh, London with the OSI. And of course, he's uh, uh, a supporter of this program, so we are grateful to him. Thank you, Ali. Um, I will, um, first of all, I want to say that um, uh, the presentation before me was really interesting because it's uh, uh, in all the, all the presentations actually, in all the conferences where I'm going, I see a lot of synergies with lots of organizations and uh, we are okay, trying, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, okay, is it okay now? No, no, you're not so Hello? Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> is it better? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, what I'm trying to do in the next uh, uh, five, ten minutes is to try to convince you uh, why uh, it is important to uh, link research with advocacy. Actually, the, the department in the Open Society Institute, uh, our huge department numbering two people, uh, is uh, called Research Advocacy and, Pol and Media Policy. Um, basically, um, what um, is important from the very beginning to, to say is um, uh, what are the values, why do we care about the media, and what do we care about in the media. And I think the, uh, the values that we are trying to, uh, to focus on in all our studies uh, are diversity of, of content, uh, pluralism, and independence of the media. These are the three key issues that we are looking at when we do all our studies, uh, when we, even if they are um, uh, studies on regulation, legislation, or, or concentration of ownership. Uh, but before going into, uh, into this presentation, I want to just give you a, a short example that uh, showed us how important it is to, uh, to link uh, our research with advocacy work. And another key word in, in our work is uh, uh, constant monitoring. Several years ago uh, uh, in Romania, which by the way boasts the um, best media legislation uh, in Europe, uh, some say, but uh, such a pity it's not implemented. Um, some years ago, um, there was um, a French, uh, a large French uh, media group uh, operating in Romania. We have carried out a lot of research on, on ownership and we, one of our recommendations, which was followed uh, by, by work in the, in the field, uh, meaning like advocacy work meetings with the governments, with regulators, was that there was a need for imposing um, a certain set of uh, ceilings of, of media ownership to secure diversity and access of more players to, uh, to frequencies. Uh, as a result, the regulator forced the, uh, the, first of all, parliament adopted legislation. They imposed a certain set of limits on uh, uh, shares of ownership. And then the regulator f uh, forced the French group to divest from one of uh, their operations in Romania to comply with the, uh, with the um, uh, conditions stated in the law. Uh, the French group uh, immediately complied with the, the request. 
uh, they sold part of their stake to another company and everything seemed to be fine. But um, uh, we stopped our work because we, we found that, our, uh, that we achieved our goal. But um, uh, in a while, our, our experts, our local experts working with us in Romania, they noticed some, some slant in the, uh, in the station that was sold by the French group. They noticed that there, was, there were lots of deals of uh, advertising sales between these uh, apparently two uh, separate groups. And we tried to uh, work with our uh, um, rudimentary journalism tools to try to find out what's happening and who actually owns this uh, new company that the French group sold. We found out through uh, a lot of work, uh, over six, seven months of work and uh, digging into archives and uh, trade registers in the Netherlands where the company was registered, that the new company that bought the French uh, operations in Romania was called Hallenberg. It was a, a Netherlands-based company. Uh, we tried to find out who actually owned this company. And then we um, uh, found out that uh, the company was sold to a, a Czech individual who was the vice president of the French media group in the Czech Republic. Uh, ironically enough, he owned uh, the f Romanian operations through another company which was called Hoax. <laughs> the whole story really showed us that uh, these people uh, uh, mocked and um, got away with all the legislation, with all the, the efforts and the advocacy efforts that we have uh, carried out in the country. And we realized how important it is to have a constant monitoring tool of, of media ownership. We realized that uh, sporadic studies on ownership on a long term and uh, don't, don't achieve much. What we have done uh, so far in-house, we have two types of research initiatives that we support. First of all, we, we carry out in-house research. And secondly, we commission, we outsource uh, smaller research uh, projects, smaller or bigger research projects, or we support and team up with various teams of uh, researchers uh, across the globe. Uh, one of our, uh, the f actually the first uh, large research that uh, the Open Society Institute completed was uh, called Television Across Europe. It was a study uh, conducted uh, in, uh, uh, finalized actually and launched in 2005. It covered 20 European countries. It was focused on Central and Eastern Europe, uh, but we also looked at four Western European countries to see, to have a, a term of comparison and to, s to see where um, Eastern European countries took inspiration from. In 2008, we followed up with a sequel to this study. Uh, we covered only 10 countries, and basically this study, and this is part of the continuity that we are trying to ensure through our work, uh, try to assess the progress that these countries made over the, the three-year period. Um, now we are in the middle of um, uh, a larger project. It's a global pro project covering 50 countries. Uh, worldwide, and it's called Mapping Digital Media. Uh, the two uh, big aspects that um, uh, we are looking at through this study um, are basically the, the, changing, the changes uh, in the media triggered, first of all, by the transition to digital broadcasting. We look at policies, legislation, um, and new poles of power, um, the, the criteria in licensing digital channels. And secondly, we look at, digit, at uh, the, the internet media. Uh, we started so far, uh, work is being conducted now on eight pilot countries. We are trying to test our methodology, which is uh, being changed according to the needs of the research. Uh, we cover for, for now uh, uh, countries such as Armenia, uh, Serbia, Italy, uh, Romania, Mexico, Thailand, Nigeria, and Morocco, but we'll add a new batch of countries by the end of the year. Um, in, uh, in total, uh, we'll do a, a, a study uh, covering over 50 countries, as I said, which we hope to finalize at the end of next year. Um, how do we work and why we are here and why um, uh, we like this initiative and we think it's important and um, uh, will help not only us but our local organizations in, in achieving their advocacy goals? Uh, we always work with local experts and with local um, organizations. In terms of research, we um, uh, hire usually uh, experts coming from academia, but in many countries they are doubled by, by people with journalism background. Uh, the entire research is being coordinated from London and it's being edited by a group of editors that um, uh, we, we, we hire as well. 
And um, we, each of these studies has a very practical uh, side, as I said. We are trying to build public awareness and to, uh, to support activism and advocacy in each of these places. Uh, as an example, um, uh, for, uh, in, the, in the television across Europe some five years ago, and in all our studies, we, at midterm, uh, during the research process, we organize a, a round table in each of these countries where we invite regulators, government agencies, uh, media experts, uh, broadcasters, and, and media companies to try to discuss the study and to, to give us feedback to the recommendations that we put forward. Each of these studies, as I said, is followed up by, uh, uh, by campaigning and uh, work at policy level. And uh, each of the studies is translated in the local languages to be able to reach to, uh, to our constituencies. But what is, Im is important is that we are really trying to uh, uh, push for, for our recommendations. And again, I, I will give you just one or two examples to show how we really work. One is, uh, I would say, a semi failure and another one would be an, uh, an achievement in the, in the making. Uh, some years ago, uh, one of the countries that we studied in the, in, uh, the television across Europe um, uh, research was Italy. And in Italy, we worked at the time with two um, highly reputed um, um, uh, re uh, academici uh, 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 academics. Uh, we invited them to the methodology meeting, something like, uh, uh, like this uh, conference. And they said that they cannot, then they will not make recommendations. Uh, we try to explain that each of the studies has to be done according to the same methodology in order to achieve comparability, and that this is one of the key uh, issues that uh, in, in our work, uh, and that is uh, pushing for recommendations and trying to, uh, to think about recommendations aimed at ensuring more diversity of content pluralism in the media and independence of the media. They kept on saying that uh, it is, uh, they will look ridiculous if they make recommendations in a country like Italy because nobody really <laughs> pays attention to any recommendations <laughs> and they will never do that. And we had to spend months and months trying to uh, work various tricks with them to try to uh, force them to write recommendations. In the end, they actually produced uh, an excellent set of, of such recommendations at policy level dealing with the independence of the public service broadcasting in Italy, dealing with issues such as concentration of ownership. And um, when we launched the report at the time, uh, the, uh, uh, Mr. Silvio Berlusconi was still the prime minister of the country, but our launch was attended by, the, uh, by some of the opposition politicians who said one of them promised that if he gets to power, uh, he will implement all the recommendations in the media legislation in Italy. Uh, you remember that uh, uh, Mr. Berlusconi lost the power at the time. Uh, the person who actually made these promises, he became the Minister of Communications, exactly the ministry that was supposed to, to make these changes. And uh, we were really surprised that actually he remembered and he invited our team of local experts who actually worked on producing the new legislation in Italy. It was almost copied and pasted uh, from, from our study. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Berlusconi came back to power. Meanwhile, and <laughs> all, the, all these recommendations were, were trashed. Uh, a second example is, is a very long uh, process of advocacy in Poland, which is actually very recent and very fresh. We have been trying, Poland is trying to, to change le legislation and trying to keep their control over the public service broadcaster in the country. Uh, again, uh, we have used the study as a tool to try to intervene in, in, in the policy process in Poland and after more than a year of work uh, in January uh, this year, we were invited to, to Parliament to present the, uh, the recommendations from our study and the findings of our study and we are now in the process of talking to, uh, to the decision makers in this country to try to uh, push for recommendations ensuring independence of the, of the public service broadcasting. <coughs> So this is the kind of work that we are doing and what we are, uh, um, uh, why we think this initiative is, is very important. First of all, uh, I think this study really uh, feeds into, into our work and as it was stressed in the previous uh, presentation, it is very important and we really uh, also believe that there is need to integrate the, uh, uh, the research done by various uh, players. Um, secondly, I think, uh, although we, I think one of uh, um, our strengths is, is the, uh, 
uh, is the fact that we managed to build networks across the, the globe. We really think that uh, uh, this initiative is, is a network booster. I think we can share our resources and our, our networks of both researchers but also uh, local organizations in the work that we are doing. Uh, third, I think uh, it is um, extremely important to take your research uh, out and I think your research can have a, a huge impact. I can give you another short example. In many of the countries that, that we work, we have uh, local foundations and local organizations and they are trying to, uh, uh, to identify dangers stemming from a concentration of, uh, of ownership. As it was said, and as we know, uh, we all know that uh, there is concentration of ownership and we know that uh, this is bad, but in many of these countries it's really important to, to be backed by solid research in order to, to achieve uh, advocacy goals. And I think your research is, uh, will be extremely important in, in uh, uh, empowering uh, these uh, civil society organizations in, in their work. Um, Fourth, I think, um, as I said at the beginning of this um, of this um, uh, short uh, or long actually uh, talk, um, we really think that uh, it is important to to ensure continuity of, of your research. Uh, we have a, uh, a website called mediapolicy.org. It's it's now being revamped, but we really try and hope to make uh, this or any other. Uh, to, to create an online platform for uh, resources on media policy. And um, we really think that uh, co studies and research on ownership uh, will become even more valuable if we are trying, if we manage to create uh, a monitoring tool to, and uh, a long-term uh, uh, monitoring tool able to, uh, to maintain and to update the database of, <coughs> of the ownership uh, trends. Uh, and finally, we have been struggling for, for many years um, to identify uh, formulas and um, uh, methodologies able to uh, gauge the impact of, of the concentration of ownership on the values uh, that we care about, uh, namely diversity of content in the media, pluralism of voices uh, and independence of the media. And I think uh, you are the best position to to help us and to help our constituencies to, uh, uh, to build such, such methodologies. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marius, uh, for putting this also in the context of other work uh, that your organization has been doing. Uh, I'd like to introduce now Ron Rice. Uh, it's a special pleasure. Uh, Ron has, um, he has a, an enormously long title uh, as the Arthur Roop Chair in Social Effects and Mass Communications in the Department of Communications and co-director of the Carsey Wolf Center for Film, Television and New Media at the University of California in Santa Barbara. <laughs> but uh, in addition, uh, he uh, has been the uh, president of the International Communication Association, which is the academic association for media researchers from around the world, which signifies the high esteem that he has earned among his colleagues around the world. Uh, well uh, well um, uh, uh, earned uh, uh, esteem because Ron has received awards for his uh, books and articles and dissertations as best of everything. Uh, numerous times uh, he has, to be specific about this area, he has authored a book and edited uh, it, uh, Media Ownership, Research and Regulation, uh, that came out two years ago. That was a major contribution in this field. Ron? But as Ben said, since uh, LA's book, I don't have to worry about revising or updating it. Um, I'm uh, grateful to be here. It's a great pleasure. I shared the program with uh, some of my colleagues, and they were all incredibly envious uh, to, uh, to, you know, for the conference and for the uh, representation of uh, the countries and all the work that you've been doing. So I was told to take good notes. Um, I'm relatively new to this area, and so I'm, what I like to talk about is the kind of things we're starting to do. And we have a lot to learn from everybody, but we're certainly open to collaborate uh, with others. And so these are the kind of areas that I like to just briefly summarize. Um, okay. 
Uh, first of all, I'm co-director of the Carsey Wolf Center's Media Ownership Project, and the Carsey Wolf Center is named after Marcy Carsey, who was the last great independent TV producer. She produced shows like The Cosby Show, um, Roseanne, and my personal favorite, The 70s Show. And she uh, was the really last major victim of the uh, repeal of the FinCEN rules. That is that um, now the networks can create their own programs and they can own their own syndication rights. And she basically uh, was sort of lost her job. And so she was very interested. Now here's an interesting paradox uh, on our advisory board. We have a lot of people who are leaders in the film and TV industry and they're very concerned about media ownership, media concentration as well, and media policy. So I think it's very dangerous to sort of, and I was quite surprised, to set up this kind of dichotomy of like the owners of industry and then we who want to fight for rights. A lot of them are very concerned about these issues as well, both because of the loss of creativity, but also the <coughs> second name is Wolf, Dick Wolf. He is the uh, originator of uh, um, the uh, law series, and um, he was very concerned about uh, media ownership and also the digital uh, media because um, he, can, he stands to lose tremendous revenue from shows and programs that get distributed for free on the internet. So they both contributed a lot to the center. And so our goals are to raise awareness about this critical issue of media ownership, which of course is no news to anyone here. Um, we like to provide venues for debates and discussion, both uh, events we film like they do, every event we do, and that goes on the, to the University of California television system, which goes out to about 15 million cable viewers. It's also available online for online viewing for downloading. So. The UC TV system basically is the outlet for the University of California academic presentations, a huge resource. So we have our own branded um, series, and so this is one way that we get uh, information out. We'd also like to, um, and I'm particularly interested in this, is defining what the core concepts are that allow us all to communicate about these issues. And so we're working with students and citizens and teachers and policymakers. Uh, we've had a series of mo uh, media ownership series events. Uh, we had a grant from the university to critical issues in uh, society, and we proposed that media ownership and concentration was one of these critical issues, and they agreed with us. We had a year-long series. Here's some of the presentations we had, and these um, became part of this edited book that Hilly mentioned. And of course, uh, several people in this room were um, part of this. And as a note, you'll see in the background I have the lovely blue ocean because I do live in Santa Barbara and it is one way to attract visitors and guest presenters. <laughs> we, offer, we offer a conference in February in Santa Barbara and everybody in the rest of the country is like freezing. So they say, sure, it doesn't matter what the topic is, you don't have to pay me, I'll be happy to come out and present, can I stick around for a while? Uh, so see, here's some other, so we're, we covered a, quite, a, a wide range of topics and we did this throughout the year in public events, we filmed everything, and then we finished up. Uh, we even had a, a live, um, this one here was great. We brought together uh, several editors of large uh, newspapers and online newspapers to talk about no issues of ownership and bias, and that drew a lot of, a lot of press attention as well. Uh, so this uh, culminated in a, I'm the Arthur and Rupa professor, and every two years I have to put on a conference, uh, which I'm very pleased to do. And uh, we, had, we brought together many of these people into new people, and Ilya was our, our, our keynote presenter. And the four main themes were what were the current condition and trends in media ownership, and, and of course, uh, Professor Noam and, and Campaign and others have been instrumental in uh, de defining what those are. What are the political and, and political and legal foundations? And this goes back to something that, that Phil was talking about. We um, also brought together historians, uh, librarians, um, uh, digital activists, uh, people to bring a lot of different perspectives on media ownership. You have, really have to understand the history of copyright in the U.S. and um, underlying value differences and the main uh, concepts of, and uh, issues that Phil has done so well in his uh, foundations of uh, telecommunications policy. Ethics, research, and regulation, there are ethical issues uh, as well. There are certain research issues. Um, again, Phil's a great uh, thought leader in this regard. And then just general media access. So we actually had the person who developed the Center for Public Integrity's uh, media tracker uh, there to present about that. So that was quite successful. And that, again, all those sessions are available as a video. 
So this was a conference. And then out of this came this edited book, which I was very fortunate uh, to be able to do. And so many of the, uh, the presentations are in here, but also uh, I scanned the environment at the time and tracked on other people who were in the midst of uh, writing uh, technical reports that hadn't yet been published yet. So we had a variety of other interesting things, like the Center for Excellence in Journalism does annual reports as well as in-depth surveys and in-depth studies, and we had one of their reports that had not yet been published. Um, I tracked down uh, Ben. Uh, he w had some technical report, and I propositioned him, and he could not, could not defend himself against my blandishment. And John, Dun John Dunbar, uh, again, for the Center for Public Integrity, they did a tremendous study on uh, funding by the media companies into the political process in the U.S. in terms of lobbying, in terms of uh, um, what we call junkets, where they provide money to Congress people, um, and also in terms of um, uh, the, the sort of what we call the revolving door, people who are on congressional staff or who are congressional senators than going into the very media industries that they were regulating. So that's a very, very uh, influential, very chilling uh, report. Uh, regulatory issues and some ethical issues, as I said. Also, we're starting up, we have some funding again from the, uh, Dick Wolf, actually, to begin this media industries uh, project. And we have a blog associated with it. And we have a planning project that's going just this year to decide what kind of media industries project should we, should we embark upon? And many of you are doing so much, and there's great centers, some of which were just mentioned today, certainly yours, we need to find much more about, um, the New America Foundation one that, that Phil's starting. So um, we have a media industries uh, project blog, and I'll give you the links to all these things at the end. We have a Digo feed where we have students and others finding interesting articles, trade articles on mediaship, and then feed into this under the Media Industries Project. And you can uh, put that feed on your site if you'd like. We have RSS feeds from a wide variety of journalists and popular press. We have media and technology blogs. We have academic blogs. There are academics who actually have time to do blogging. I don't know how they do it. That's another secret we need to find out about. Of course, there's tremendous uh, information in the industry trades themselves, all the background uh, discussions. And then in uh, entertainment law, there's a tremendous amount of news that are relevant to the media ownership. So this site provides access to those things. A wide variety of other kinds of links, certainly some of the places that have already been mentioned. Pew Internet does a tremendous job in, uh, doing surveys and studies and making all that data available uh, publicly. As you can see, there's many other uh, sources for data and uh, policy issues relating to the media industries. Again, I'll give you the links to links. I'm currently this term actually teaching a graduate seminar on media ownership and industries because we're doing all these things. I like to leverage the work, so the work of the graduate students then also contributes to the media industries project. They also get to uh, participate in events. Every one of them wanted to fly out and come to this conference. Um, and we're using two books, the one that I did, but also another one by Jennifer Holt um, and Perrin, which takes a more cultural studies and media studies approach to media industries, trying to develop a, a research field actually called uh, media industries research. And the, four, the five main areas that are discussed in this particular course, again, concepts and historical background. We talk about media concentration today, but uh, uh, Tim was mentioning, you know, if you look at certain prior times, uh, that there were, there were very, very uh, salient media ownership and concentration issues. And uh, also focusing on the de uh, digital media and the effects on traditional uh, industries, as well as the f ones that they're generating themselves. So there's all sorts of discussion just in the last year on the future of the press, the, the newspapers. But of course, there are many online newspapers and many, many forms of digital news. So we're looking at, at those as well. Here, um, here's the website for Professor Holtz, uh, a tremendous uh, site for resources for media industries research, Prof. Holt at Blogspot. Um, I have my own listing of, of uh, media ownership uh, sites, and you can't really write this down now, but I can give you that information. We also have a course week, and we're using that to create a, a resource which will be available to the Media Industries uh, Project. We have descriptions on books on uh, media ownership, 
and we have annotations of them in the table of contents. There are sources. We have about 80 of those so far. Um, we have PowerPoints or sor sources, other sources, of course, readings, uh, so materials that people could use in their classes or for research. And right now we're starting to uh, identify and describe media centers around the U.S. and then uh, maybe in collaboration with your project we can begin to identify them throughout the world as well. And we're collecting all this information on the media centers both to d identify where our media industry project should be located but also then resources for everybody else. So we're collecting a lot of information on the topics on the format, how they're structured, how they're funded, what kind of outputs they have, what kind of activities they do. And then we're trying to do, this is just a, again, just early data, trying to, to show where these things uh, co-locate in some kind of space. So this is just the kinds of outputs and the kind of memberships and the kind of funding. And uh, so you could say, well, if I wanted to do newsletters, what do other centers do in collaboration with that? And so you can look on here and see where the newsletters are located and see where it's located with uh, books, uh, journals and magazines, and teaching tools. Then you can also flip it and also look at the centers. And so based upon those same kinds of things, here's the first 24 centers we have. And you can then say, well, strategically, where would we like to be? Who would we like to be identified with? Or what kind of space might be open? So we're, we're working on that. I'll skip over these. And then also we're doing, a, a basically, the graduate students are doing um, research reports and projects on specific topics that are of interest to, to them that are also related to the Media Industries Project. And those will also be available on the Media Industries Project site as well. And it covers really an interesting range, including one that I thought was particularly interesting. We have a student who's a very serious um, online games player. And he thought, wouldn't it be great if you developed a kind of a simulation of a game that people could learn about media ownership industries? So if they took certain actions to like engage in mergers or to acquire, or if the regulations changed, what would be your uh, you know, control of the marketplace? So just based on a few concepts, maybe this could be used in high school. So that's um, a kind of an overview of what we're up to, and here are, um, here are the uh, final sites, sorry. All right, let's get to the end, come on. Okay, so if you like, there are some uh, links to some of the sites we're doing, so thank you very much. So thank you, thank you, Ron, for uh, a very informative presentation about uh, things that are being done both in your institutions and elsewhere. And uh, so we kind of like creating here networks of networks, as it were. So this is kind of very good. So we have now, okay, we have now heard what researchers have been doing, what they are doing, and what they should be doing. All right, and so now we don't have much time left, but we can be happy to uh, have uh, people uh, speak and perhaps uh, identify themselves also uh, so to increase the networking effect. Uh, Heather Hudson, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Heather Hudson, um, currently director of the Institute of Social and Economic Research at the University of Alaska, Anchorage, which is in a state with a small market and very r related to rural areas and also developing regions. Um, just a comment and a question. Um, the comment is I thought it was interesting and ironic that this conference was scheduled um, just after we heard that Carlos Slim is now the wealthiest man in the world because he made most of his money from a highly integrated, vertically integrated telecom company, a Telmex, much like Tim described, 18, early AT&T. And because he's also an investor in, in a lot of other media, including the New York Times. Um, so. That raises the issue which I, I, that Tim brought out very well, which I, I thought was um, information industries. Um, and I guess two co comment and a question I had. One was the comment that I think that how the various points that were raised by the panelists apply to smaller markets, and we heard some about Eastern Europe, which is very relevant, um, including smaller markets within countries such <coughs> as the US, Canada, Australia, where there's indigenous populations or small markets, as well as 
developing countries where there's less investment, probably, or attraction of investment, and in developing countries, usually weaker institutions to guide policy or even provide some regulatory framework. So that's the first question or point. Okay, um, so I guess um, the question the question uh, is Heather, Heather, how can have, you? We have ten minutes. Yeah. And okay. Keep, the question sorry. is, um, are is this collective group adding what I would call a, a third dimension of um, various information industries to to what Tim was talking about the the three levels? And I think a a third dimension there might be multiple would would be internet, meet, um, wireless, and other industries that, that can be concentration, concentrated in terms of both transport and content. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't heard as much about so far. Can I, can I try and answer that? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I think I failed to do in my, uh, in my uh, discussion was just to get, you know, concentration can mean so many things. And I think it's very hard for us you know, the traditional uh, model in the United States and, and also for the rest of the world is there was, for a long time, basically one cartel or one monopoly per industry policy. <laughs> for a long time, you know, you had the film studios did this and the, and, and what's confusing about right now, I think, is we, we still, and a lot of researchers are still sort of thinking about this, this is a problem the FCC has, uh, was, you know, the FCC, the FCC has always had this problem in, in America, uh, is you have, uh, you know, industry power that is, it's not recognizable in traditional ways often because it spans many different industries. And so it's confusing to an economic analysis that's trying to examine concentration in a single industry. You know, how do you, how do you figure out, you know, for example, how do you figure out what Google is? Just as an example, I, I, no one can really, it doesn't, it's not an industry. It's a search engine, a very powerful search engine. It's not like AT&T was, it's confusing to people. And, and the media conglomerates, even though they were invented in the 70s, 60s, they're still very confusing because they own all, you know, what do you do with a company that owns a bunch of random properties and what is, does that mean they're powerful or not? Um, you know, it, it's very confusing for the antitrust law. This comes back to antitrust law because antitrust law has com is completely focused on horizontal concentration and on prices. Two things which don't matter to my mind that much in media. What matters is information power and suffocation of innovation. So we really do need new ways to think about this stuff. Uh, and that, I'll leave it there. Okay, uh, we'll, take, we'll take some more questions. Um, and here's the first thing. The media okay, is but, here. But guys, uh, <laughs> everybody keep it, keep it short. Hi, I'm Dave Burstein. I write about some of this stuff. <coughs> and I like to take academia and use it in the real world. Right now, Brian Roberts is at the Senate Commerce Committee trying to explain why he can take over, a big, he should be allowed to take over a big piece of Hollywood. Meanwhile, his partner, Steve Burke, has been telling everybody in Hollywood that they've got to keep all the premium content off free TV over the internet, that you can only buy it through the TV everywhere, and what the cable companies hope to do to keep some revenues going. Uh, and seeing a lot of success in that. Hulu, Hulu may be crippled, for example, despite the fact it's now down to two cents an hour to send standard definition TV. So let me ask the academics here to turn it around. If you were the guy at the FCC trying to figure out how to prevent Comcast from keeping content off the free internet, ad supported, let's keep piracy out of it, how would you make that work in Washington in the real world? And I know that's a U.S. question, but I know there are also parallels on that happening all over the place. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, but briefly, but we don't want to get engaged now in kind of Washington. It's that there's so many people who do that in Washington. But this is the big issue. Yeah, turn, it, it's turn, it's turn, big, turn it around to the real world. It's a big issue, but not necessarily in this country. Let, let me just so, so the, so the question is really not how, it's why. What? Just a quick... It's, he asked the question, how should the FCC, and I say the question should be, why should the FCC? I mean, that the argument should be, the discussion should be why. Mm. I'm not on the panel. Okay, um, yes. Uh, Amanda Moore, I would guess I'm a consumer of these reports. Um, question for Phil, what do you mean by information ecology research? I'm not familiar with that term. <coughs> yeah, I should have, uh, it's, it's yeah. It's a recently made up term. What it, what, what, the way we're thinking of it is the idea of looking at the environment 
in which information circulates. So we, we start to not just ask who owns what, but there's, so there's multiple layers. There's the process of, you know, there are the outlets, there's the content that's produced. I mean, I, I, that's what I think would be to, to, to reference it to another example. A recent study that the, that the Pew Foundation did, where they examined the flow of news in one city. So they looked at Baltimore, and they looked at all the different outlets, and they used about six different stories. And they looked at where reporting actually originated from. That is, which, which media outlets were producing news versus which were simply disseminating news that was produced elsewhere. So you start to look not just at outlets, but actual resources and actual content. And then I would take then the next step further and look at actual outcomes. Okay, so in terms of the sorts of things that, that Ellie was starting to illustrate in his presentations. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know if that, if that helped clarify this a bit. I mean, I, you, know, you, might, you might talk to somebody else who would define it very differently. But I, 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 I see it as looking at, at, the, at the entire process by which information flows through a community. Uh, one, more, one more comment or question. Um, and and uh, uh, you 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 uh, you had uh, you wanted to make an announcement. I'd like to make an announcement. This is from the from the World uh, Free Press Organization. You probably know Ron Govan from uh, Eastern Europe, and he's now in uh, in, in Paris. Uh, there's an appeal going out to the uh, from all kinds of journalistic and related. Uh, fields to the Iranian government, which is currently the holder in prison of the greatest number of journalists in the world. And this appeal is being presented to the uh, Iranian government, and uh, I simply would like to convey to you that there is a text for this, and if any of your organizations would like to sign and join with the World uh, Free Press Organization and the Open Society folks and the uh, committee, the free uh, committee to uh, protect journalists, yeah, uh, sign on with it. Uh, thank you very much. You'll be outside. Uh, ben, yes? I, I wanted to make one thing that, that didn't come up here, and that is the, uh, the money aspect of, of academic research. Um, the, and where the funding comes from. You've, uh, there's a phrase, if, if you're an English speaker, that native, that uh, he who pays the piper can call the tune. And I think uh, w one of the issues of academic research is uh, the, the perception of the result given the funding. Uh, this occurred to me when Ron talked about the sort of the, the agenda that, that his center has, and I don't know the, you know, the papers behind it and so forth, but, but if, if the funding comes from a, an advocacy group or, or something that's per perceived to have a point of view, whether it's AT&T or Free Press or wherever, uh, that that contain, contained any research that wants to be used for any policy purpose. Uh, my suggestion, what, I, what we did at Harvard years ago, was to essentially set up a pool where we took money from everyone, that is, small doses of money from all the players with all different interests, and we set the agenda of what to research. It's very hard to do, but then no one could accuse the researchers of being in anyone's pocket. And I think. It's, it's very important to keep an eye on, on the research. Even, even when it, it looks straight, there's always the perception. I have a comment on that, too. I think academics should, first of all, disclose all their funding. Uh, I'll say, by the way, Free Press doesn't pay me any money because we don't have any money. But, <laughs> um, and also, academics shouldn't take so much money. It's a huge problem uh, because we have salaries, so we don't have to take money, supposedly. You know, most of us take... I, 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 especially in this problem in America in particular, is we, we actually get fairly decent salaries and the point is so we don't have to be, you know, industry researchers. But then people will go ahead and still take industry money and I've always thought it's a, a corrupt practice to take money when you're already paid to do research. Now sometimes you need it because some data stuff is extremely expensive, but sometimes you don't and some people just write the same papers but double their salary. With, <laughs> with industry. Not, not, just yeah. industry, not just industry money. Yeah. Any, any money, I agree, any money. We, yeah. we, uh, I agree we, we, are, we are out of time. Sorry. However, let me just say, uh, kind of this project, uh, until a few days ago, was kind of running and humming and had zero budget. Okay? <laughs> everybody here, uh, everybody on these team members did this from their own from their own volition, and they were willing to come here at their own on their own nickel. Uh, and really, it wasn't just a nickel; 
if you have to come here from China or from, from other other countries. So so this was a zero budget project. Yeah, However, we have that's to cover this. <laughs> <laughs> that that said, okay, that said, uh, if you do data research and you have to collect stuff, uh, you, you kind of think you've heard uh, Phil, for example, kind of mentioning this, and, and other people kind of you just need to have. I mean, it's maybe maybe legal research is cheaper, but kind of. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but there's sure. some some work that needs to be done that requires help, and the help needs to be paid, and so that's just kind of the way it works. So, uh, with those kind of uh, word of conclusion, I would like to thank our panel, which has a uh, significant market share in the uh, influence, academic influence over this topic here, and so in the United States certainly, and in the room uh, globally. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming here, and uh, we are closing, we're kind of four minutes behind schedule. Our first speaker for the, after, for the next panel has to catch a plane, so please be back here at, uh, in about 12 minutes if you can.